blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank God for another Your Divine Appointment, which is the media ministry of the Divine Jackson MD Ministries. I'm Dr. Jackson. Thank you for joining us to study the Word of God together here in Thursday School, which is Sunday School on a Thursday. We're grateful to God for this privilege to study these international Sunday School lessons. They are found on all of our different um, uh, social media platforms, and they're available 24 hours a day for your study. And uh, we're grateful and would like to ask you if you would like and share uh, this video on Facebook, and would you so kindly subscribe to our YouTube channel? It makes a difference. It makes a difference in our ratings so we can reach more people to tell them about Jesus. Will you do that for us? We would appreciate it so much. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah to your name. We come in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And we come, my God, to the heavenly table to be fed the bread of God, which is bread for the soul, that we be fed and transformed by it. We pray, Lord, that you bless us in this study. Let myself and my brothers, sisters, and friends never be the same again because of this divine encounter. This we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. Glory to God. Well, we bless God for uh, these wonderful studies. And here we are the last Sunday in July. Wow. July the 31st, 2022. And this is our final lesson in the book of St. John. Uh, this whole month we've enjoyed this precious book. And today we are in chapter 14, verses 15 through 29. And uh, we will be reading in the uh, King James Version momentarily. But first, we want to go into something very special. And that is, this is our uh, next phase of our Bible Spotlight. <laughs> oh, glory to God. We're glad for the spotlights. We've completed the uh, post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, all 13 of them. So if you missed any of them, please feel free to go back and study and review them again. And today we're beginning um, our uh, uh, view of the Great Commission. And this flows so perfectly with the post-resurrection appearances because when we look at the post-resurrection appearance of the Lord Jesus, um, he gave his disciples, we call it the Great Commission because he gave his disciples their final charge, their final instruction of what the church is to do. And uh, certainly we, here we are a couple of thousand years later, amen? The church, we want to still be about our Father's business, be about what Jesus told the church to do. Jesus did not come back and give a second commission. So what commission he gave the church then that's our job ongoing, amen? And uh, we want to occupy until he comes. Glory to God. And so uh, we're looking at the uh, Great Commission. We'll look at it in four parts. And uh, the passage we want to look at today is found in the book of Matthew. Most people, when they think of the Great Commission, they think of the passages in Matthew 28 and Mark 16, and those are included. But we have two others that we add as well to get a more complete picture of the commission given to the church. So the one we're looking at today uh, is in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 and 8. Matthew 10, 7 and 8. And I'll be reading in uh, the King James Version. It says, as, and as you go, preach. Here's what you're to preach. Saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Wow, that's your sermon. And then there are four things I want you to do. I want you to heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. And then he gives a caveat at the end. Freely you've received, freely give. Wow, that's quite a commission. And uh, let's uh, look more particularly at what's included here. He starts out saying, preach. So the job, the word uh, preach literally means to pronounce or to announce, to proclaim. It's to broadcast uh, information. And uh, many have described preaching as like someone having a seed pouch and they reach into their seed and they get a handful of seed and they widely cast the seed out to the soil that's all around. 
to preach, proclaim it widely. Some even uh, have used the descriptive term that preaching is to hurl the gospel as though it's a, a pitcher with a ball in their hand. And the pitcher takes it and with all of their body mechanics and strength, they throw the ball a very, very great distance. So to preach is proclaiming, hurling, casting the seed out widely. Amen. Whereas teaching has to do more with explanatory details of the word of God. Preaching is the wide announcement of it. Now, uh, people have pr uh, preaching a lot of different things, especially in this day. Some people have are preaching a whole nother gospel that really is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've come up with their own gospel and they're pronouncing it and, and I announcing it and proclaiming it and hurling it. They're doing a lot of preaching, but they're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We as the church have been assigned the church, the body of Christ's job is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And of course, the word gospel, there's a whole uh, background on that. But uh, many simplify and say the gospel refers to good news. Other people look at other uh, elements of the word. But it's the good news about Jesus Christ, that Jesus came, paid the price for sin, that we may be saved. And how many glad about that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Glory to his name. He says here, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we just want to touch on that part today. And we'll get to the other parts in a future spotlight. The reason this is important is when we look at the ministry of John the Baptist, and when we look at the early ministry of the Lord Jesus, particularly we see the record there in those early chapters of Matthew, John the Baptist, uh, and of course, many say more specifically, John the Baptizer, because some people say, well, he wasn't a Baptist as far as the denomination. Well, there weren't any denominations. <laughs> Praise God. So we always call him John the Baptist, but we know he was John the Baptizer. Well, John, of course, uh, was of the tribe of Levi. His father, uh, Zechariah, was a, a priest. Um, and so he's of the tribe of uh, uh, Levi. And specifically, he's of the descendants of Aaron because they were um, uh, uh, the priests. And then his mother, Elizabeth, is of the daughters of Aaron. So on both sides, he's a descendant of, uh, of Aaron. And so he would be in line to be a priest. But the Lord chooses John, hallelujah, to be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus. And so his job is a forerunner is, of course, to run before the forerunner. And in that day, uh, they didn't have, of course, internet and, you know, things to uh, uh, announce things by sending out a broadcast email. Uh, uh, what they would do, they didn't have satellite uh, television, all those things. So the way they would do this is when a king was going to come to a village, there was a person who would go to the village before the king arrived, literally running in. And out in the street, they would proclaim, the king is coming, the king is coming, the king is coming. And as they yelled this out, all the people in their homes would hear, they would come out of their homes and line up along the pathway of the roadway and wait for the king so that whatever the king had to say, they could hear it. And so after he had rightly announced, so the, the forerunner would run a little further down and do the same thing. The king is coming. The king is coming. The people would come out and line up along the, uh, as we would for a parade, line up along the street um, because we want to be ready for when the king arrives. We don't want the king to arrive. And then we're just now trying to get people prepared to listen. Oh, glory to God. So the forerunner's job was to prepare the people to hear the voice of the king. John, as the forerunner of the Lord Jesus, his job was to prepare the people to hear the voice of the king, Jesus, the sweet savior. Amen? So John now uh, comes and uh, he's in, coming in the power and the uh, uh, spirit of Elijah, amen, from that prophetic word that was in the book, book of Malachi. And Jesus verified in a passage that John the Baptist, John, he was the fulfillment of that Old Testament prophecy in Malachi that the Lord said that someone would come in the power and the spirit of the great prophet Elijah. Oh, glory to God. You know, John was out in the wilderness uh, eating locusts, wild honey, uh, leather girdle about his waist, glory to God, wearing camel hair. Praise God. He, you know, this isn't what you 
fine apparel that you'd find in king houses, as the scriptures say. But John was a man that was out there in the wilderness crying out, hallelujah, proclaiming, preaching. And what was his sermon? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his sermon. Now, John the Baptist as, so to speak, a bridge between the Old Testament. The Lord ceases to give any new revelation, no fresh word. 400 years later, now John begins preaching. He begins preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's the bridge before uh, the bridge from the Old Testament, preparing the people for the New Testament. The New Testament is Jesus. The New Testament begins with his birth. So John is that bridge and preaches that the kingdom of heaven's at hand. The Lord Jesus, when he begins to preach, is there in a Matthew chapter, uh, we'll see that Matthew is chapters three and four and in there, Jesus begins preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The same words that John said, Jesus was saying. John, as a faithful forerunner, said what the king would say so that there's no clashing of the messages. It's the same message. So John serves as both the forerunner to tell the people, get your heart ready to hear from the king. And he serves in a prophetic role, himself preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, John was a great man. Jesus himself said, man born of a woman, uh, none greater than John. Glory to God. And so, so many precious things. It's important when we're looking at the Great Commission that we recognize that the bridge from the Old Testament to the New, John the Baptist, and the Lord Jesus when he starts his ministry, they're saying the same thing, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. And Jesus here, as he's going to be leaving the scene, he has the church, the church basically taking the baton. John passed the baton to Jesus. John said, he must increase, but I must decrease. So John the Baptist hands the baton to the Lord Jesus. He has his three-year ministry. The Lord Jesus is getting ready to leave. He hands the baton to you and I, the church. And what's our message? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. <laughs> we need to stay with the message. Glory to God. Somebody got your baton in your hand. Oh, you want to run your race. <laughs> Don't drop your baton. Keep your baton. Run the race. Amen. Glory to God. And we are, we labor unto death. Amen. We don't retire out of God. We may retire out of certain positions and we start serving in another area. That kind of thing happens all the time. And it's a needful thing. There's transitions of that nature. But we don't stop serving God till we die. Be thou faithful unto death. And I'll give you a crown of life. So there is ministry. There's service. There's uh, work for us to do to advance the kingdom of God to be done until the day we go home. Amen. So that is the message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, our time is getting away from us. So let me say one more thing. So what does it mean at hand? At hand means it's near, literally like to your hand. It means a thing is close. It's right here. It's upon you. It has arrived. That's what it means at hand. And the kingdom of heaven, it's at hand. Jesus has come. Oh, blessed be God. We'll have to pick that up next time. Glory to God, looking at the Great Commission. Lord, we love you today. Well, our lesson today for July the 31st, 2022, the Word gives peace. Oh, glory to God. And here, uh, John chapter 14, verses 15 through 29. And I'm reading in the King James Version. The Word of the Lord says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, uh, and, and what I'm about to read, he's going to say three times in this passage. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, that's a whole message of itself. Everybody, so to speak, running around saying, I love Jesus. But are we keeping his commandments? To love him is to obey him. He said it. Hallelujah. Over in John chapter 8, verse 31. Uh, if ye are my disciples indeed, if you continue in my word, then... Are ye my disciples indeed? Oh, glory to God. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? Here, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He goes on. So obedience to God is the marker of loving him. Oh, God, help us to love you. Help us to obey you. 
Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter, and he will be with you forever. The Lord Jesus, now this passage here in uh, John chapter 14, when you look in your Bibles, it's a red letter edition. Red letter meaning uh, the print is in uh, the color red, symbolizing that these are the words of the Lord Jesus. You, When you look, you see that Portions of chapter 13, that's where the, um, uh, the the Last Supper is occurring and the Lord Jesus establishes what we now call Holy Communion. Uh, and uh, But part of chapter 13 is in red, but all of 14 and all of 15 and all of 16 and 17, all of those are in red. This is what many call the final discourse, D-I-S-C-O-U-R-S-E, the final discourse, the final uh, uh, statement, if you will, the closing statement of the ministry of the Lord Jesus when he's talking to his disciples. So they leave the upper room where they've just had the Lord's Supper. They're en route over to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, which is, of course, where the Lord Jesus is going to be uh, arrested and so on on that night. But as the Lord Jesus is with his disciples, many believe it's while he's walking toward um, the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, he's giving these instructions, these teachings. So there's some powerful principles that we find in these passages. And of course, chapter 17 is known as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. That whole chapter basically of uh, John 17 is Jesus praying for us. So if we want to know how to pray, let's look and see how Jesus prayed. Uh, aren't you glad to know he prayed for you and he prayed for me and he's advocating for us even now. So praise God. So this is part of this great um, final discourse. Well, Anytime someone is closing out something and giving their final statements, it's pretty important that we give attention. Jesus lays out some powerful principles, just as back when he did the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, and it's also repeated in parts in Luke, just like in, in Matthew chapter 5, so to speak, the launching of his teaching ministry Key principles. When somebody launches a, a new ministry, launches a new project, it's important to listen. What are what are their thoughts? And you see multiple chapters in red. Most of chapter five, all of chapter six, a good portion of chapter seven, the Lord Jesus teaching. Well, now at the end of his ministry, the close, here we have several chapters in red again. Amen. Here he starts laying out many things about uh, uh, some things having to do with uh, loving him and walking with him, things about the Holy Spirit and what he's going to be and do, and things about what our relationship with one another should be. Many things are covered here. So he starts out, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, praise God, because uh, there's no need for him to give us commands and keep talking to us if we haven't made a commitment to obey them. <laughs> Why talk to somebody and they've made no commitment to listen to what you're saying? Hallelujah. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now listen to what I'm saying. He says, uh, and I'm going to pray the Father, and he's going to send you another comforter, comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now, another comforter, uh, many look at, uh, when they look at the meaning of that word, one just like me, one of a similar essence, amen? And so, and so here we have Jesus, the Son, saying, I'm going to pray to the Father, and the Father is going to send the Spirit. The comforter is the Holy Ghost, and that's specified in a later scripture. And he's going to be with you forever. Jesus is laying another preparation. I'm leaving, but I'm going to send you somebody. And the one I send will be with you forever. Aren't we glad to know? Holy Spirit is with us forever. Oh, bless his name. Um, and this is Comforter with a capital C. This is his name. He is the Comforter. Anybody been comforted by the Spirit? Oh, glory to God. Look at verse 17. Even the Spirit of Truth, that's another one of his many names, whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't see him and neither does it know him, but you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. This is comparing, of course, the relationship of the world to the Holy Spirit versus the church. Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, two different uh, names, identical, uh, uh, two different names for the Spirit of God. Amen? Now, he's saying here that the world can't see him, doesn't know him, all of that. But for you, the church, he's with you and he's going to be in you. And of course, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes and they are filled with the Spirit of God. Amen? 
So what a beautiful relationship here. This comforter is not someone that's going to be kind of nearby, whatever. Going to be with you and in you. Oh, praise God for that. Look at 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I'm going to come to you. Amen. This comforter is coming to us. Amen. And he's also called the spirit of Christ. So there's that relationship. Spirit of God is also called the spirit of Christ because of the unity. Amen. Verse 19, yet a little while and the world sees me no more, but you see me. Then he says, because I live, you live also. Now, the part about because I live, you live also, of course, we have eternal life from Jesus. Jesus is the life. Amen. So that's a separate point. The point he's making just before there has to do with something a little different. He says, a little while the world is not going to see me, but you will. And this has to do with the fact, of course, on this night, he's going to be arrested. Shortly thereafter, of course, um, he's going to be crucified and so on. And then, of course, the world will won't see him for those three days. But in a larger sense, referring to the fact that he is leaving, going back to the Father. This is really making sure the disciples understand, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be leaving. Amen. And they've been with him three years. And wow. Just the thought, Jesus is leaving. Can you imagine the heartbreak? But he's letting them know, listen, you're not going to be comfortless. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's going to be with you. He's going to be in you. I won't leave you comfortless. So he is comforting them and simultaneously informing them of his departure and comforting them to let them know I've made provisions for you. <laughs> Holy Spirit is going to be with you and in you. Glory to God. And of course, the life now, the life that's in me is in you. He also says that uh, the world sees me no more, but you see me. And of course, one of the ways in which we will see the Lord is by the spirit of Christ, who is the Holy Spirit. Amen. And he is going to be the light and the life of Christ working in us. Oh, glory to God. Look at verse 20. Uh, he says, at that day, uh, you shall know that I am uh, in, that I am in my father and you're in me and I'm in you. And there's other times where he uses those kind of phrases where you're in me, I'm in you, I'm, we're all in the father. And then over in the Colossians, it picks it up in chapter three. Uh, For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God, showing this unity. Amen. And those that love me, my father will love them and we will love them. And all of this unity uh, uh, between the sweet Savior and the father and us. Glory to God. And that day you shall know that I am in my father and ye in me and I in you. Look at verse 21. And of course, this unity that we're talking about here is by the new birth. We have to be born again to experience this unity that's talking about here. Where we're, he's in us and all of these things. This is if we're born again. Verse 21, he that has my commandments and keeps them. Well, this takes us back to the very first verse of the lesson where he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Here's the second time he's basically saying the same thing. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. He's driving that home. And how important that is in this day as well, because people all over talking about, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. But the evidence that we love him is a life of obedience to him. God, help us to love you and obey that's how it goes. Amen. There's, there's evidence that uh, proves we love him. And that's a life of obedience to him. Oh, really God, help us today. And he goes on to say, and he that loves me shall be loved to my father. And I will love him and will manifest or make myself known to him uh, and make myself known to him. And of course, the spirit of God, again, just as in verse 19, the spirit of God in us is the spirit of Christ who makes known the Lord unto us. One of these verses in this final discourse talks about how the spirit of God um, receives of Christ, receives the ones that belongs to Christ. And he's not speaking of his own. Spirit of God is speaking about the Lord Jesus. So this incredible unity. Amen. Uh, look at, uh, it says, um, in verse 22, now Judas says to him, this is not Iscariot, right? Because Judas Iscariot is not the one speaking here. But Judas says to him, Lord, how is it that you're going to show yourself, manifest, show yourself unto us, but not to the world? How's that going to happen? 
Jesus answers and says to him, if a man loves me, we're back to the love. This is the third time he's saying about the love and the commandment to him, the love and the obedience to him. Jesus says, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. Amen. So he said it three times. If you love me, you keep my commandments. Glory to God. If a man loves me, he will keep my words. And here's what's going to happen. My father will love him, just as said a couple of verses above. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And of course, that's by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is how we will see the Lord. But the world won't by way of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is the revealer about Christ. Uh, let's take a look uh, at these uh, two passages, 1 Corinthians 12 and 3, and also 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. Uh, these give us to know in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, no man can say that Jesus is the Christ, but by the Holy Ghost. The only way we know that Jesus is the Christ, it has to be the Spirit of God that makes it known to us. Now, when the Lord, and of course, now the Holy Spirit has come. When, when Peter first said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the God, Jesus said, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. The Father revealed it to you, Peter. Now we're in the church age. The Spirit of God in us is revealing and manifesting, making known, showing us how Jesus is the Christ. So we're able to see and to know him by the work of the Spirit in our life. Amen. And then in 1 Corinthians 2.14, it talks about how the natural man doesn't see the things of God. And neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man doesn't have spiritual eyes. He only has natural eyes. He's not born again. We have to be born again, regenerated to get the spiritual eyes, which can see spiritual things. The natural man can't. The spiritual man can. That's why the necessity that we be born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be. Marvel not. Don't be amazed, Nicodemus. You must be born again. Oh, glory to God. Now look at 24. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings. So where's the other three say, if you love me, you keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. This one gives the reverse. If you don't love me, the, the, those that don't keep my commandments, they don't love me. Amen. He that doesn't love me doesn't keep my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the father's which sent me. And we dealt with that uh, at a previous time. Uh, the scriptures that show that the Father sent the Son into the world. The Father sent him. The Father sent him. The Father sent him. Even St. John 3, 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Many verses show the Father sent the Son. Amen? And he's saying those that don't love me, they won't keep my sayings. Those that don't keep my sayings, they don't love me. All right? Uh, and the words I'm giving you, these are not things I came up with, but the Father that sent me. That's very important because already establishing uh, that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent the Messiah, who is the, who is the Christ, whose name is Jesus. Amen? The Father sent him. But here's the other piece of it. There's a passage of scripture that speaks about how just as the Father sent the Son so also the Son is sending us as the church. And Jesus, being that he was sent by the Father, he didn't say his own words. He said what the Father told him to say. In like manner, Jesus sending us, we shouldn't say what we think, but we should say what Jesus said because he's the one who is sending us. Oh, glory to God. There's that baton again. The Father sent the Son, and the Son is sending us the church. Tell everybody about me. Glory to God. Uh, look at verse uh, 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, praise God, whom the Father will send in my name. He said earlier uh, that uh, in verse um that I'm going to pray the Father. That was verse 16. Jesus the Son is going to ask the Father 
to send the Spirit. Now here in verse 26, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, which the Father is going to send in my name. What is he going to do? He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I've said to you. The things I've been teaching you all this time. Glory to God. When he, the spirit of truth, because everything Jesus is teaching is truth. When the very spirit of truth wow, is inside of you, he's going to remind you. He's going to bring it to your remembrance, the things that I have taught you. Oh, glory to God. How beautiful is that? Look at verse 27. Verse many people have memorized. Jesus is saying all these different things. And then he says, peace. Glory to God. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world giveth. Look at this. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Uh, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I've given you my peace. And then he specifies, I'm not doing this the way the world gives peace. I'm giving it a different way. Because the world's peace is circumstantial. Things going well, you got peace. Trouble time, peace gone. Jesus says, my peace I give it. Peace I leave with you. Part two, my peace, I'm giving it to you. Not the way the world gives it. The peace of the Lord is a perpetual. Just as the light of Christ is a perpetual light, the peace of God is a perpetual peace. Glory to God. Oh, how precious is that. We have many verses about peace. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on me? Because he trusts in me. Many things about the peace of God. Jesus says in uh, John 16, 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. All these things about the peace of God. How beautiful is that? Then he says at the end of verse 27, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Your heart's going to want to tend to go that way. But don't let your heart be troubled. And don't let it be afraid. There are troubling circumstances. There's trouble in the world. There's trouble around us. But don't let your heart take that and it become trouble. The trouble is all around. But in your heart, don't let the trouble get in there. Let peace abide. Glory to God. Let the peace of God rule in our hearts to the which also we're called in one body and we're to be thankful. Oh, glory to God. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The troubled heart, the fearful heart is everywhere. What a testimony when the followers of Christ, the believers walk in the peace of God. Glory to God. Verse 28, ye have heard how I said unto you, I'm going away. He's saying it again. Hallelujah. I go away. And come again unto you. He says, excuse me, ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto my father, for my father is greater than I. 29. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it comes to pass, you might believe. His focus is always faith. Remember now, he's going to be uh, very shortly in that same evening, he's going to be arrested. So he's talking now about him going away. He's talking all about peace and the spirit of God and the comforter and all that. Then he's coming back to the reminder again, I'm going away. Glory to God. And he says in there, interesting thing, if you really love me, you would rejoice because I'm getting to go to my father. But of course, he also understands their brokenness to see him go. <laughs> uh, so he puts that in there. If you're really happy for me, I'm going to a wonderful place. Um, so even though I won't be with you, it'll be a glorious thing. So uh, to help soften your mourning about my leaving, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. But I'm going to be leaving. Hallelujah. I just reminded him, I'm going to be leaving. Praise God. And he says, and I'm going into my father. My father is greater than I. Amen. Amen. And of course, he says, I do always the will of my father. I'm doing what I saw my father do. I'm doing what my father told me to say. My father, my father, my father. In like manner, we should be following King Jesus, King Jesus, King Jesus, King Jesus. Amen. Because he is greater than we are. Glory to God. Um, and uh, I told you these things beforehand 
uh, before they come to pass, so you will believe. Praise God. Not only, amen, him being arrested, but all the sufferings he'll go through, and they're going to know that he'll be crucified and buried. But he shall rise again. Praise God. So this is to comfort them, for them to be ready, so that when they see the terrible sufferings of the Lord, he's crucified and all, so that they'll know that's not the end of the story. Its story doesn't end there. Glory to God. Receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior, even now. Whoever you are, wherever you are. If you have not received him, Lord, forgive me for my sins. I receive Jesus as my Savior. I believe he's your son. He lived. He died for me to pay my penalty of sin. He rose again. He's alive. I leave my old life. I receive Jesus. Save me. Make me born again. I'm following Jesus all the days of my life. Pray a prayer sincere to God. He will receive you. Transform you. You'll be born again. My brothers, sisters, and friends, I'm so glad you joined us for this wonderful study. Remember this. The God in the Bible is real. Prepare for your divine appointment with him. It's coming. God bless you till we meet again. <laughs>